So the average person they must be in his 80s? Yes. We have some, a few that are in high 70s, but most yeah, of the 40, 80s. 42, already 42 when I went in. That's uh, 64 years ago. Yes. 64, 64 years? <laughs> what am I still doing on this planet? <laughs> We're rolling. Okay, this is an interview at the Westbury Public Library, Westbury, New York. It is the 10th of uh, August, 2006, approximately 9.30 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My full name is Joseph Struhl, S-T-R-U-H-L. I was born in Manhattan, New York City. And my date of birth was 10 21 Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I graduated from Boys High and NYU I just had before I went in, I had about uh, only a little over a year. Mm -hmm. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, no, I was at home mm -hmm. in, uh, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how you heard about it? I heard about it. Uh, is this where Roosevelt said something about a date of infant? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's when I heard it. I heard it on the radio. On the radio, okay. Do you remember your reaction at all to this? Yeah, uh, my reaction was I got to get in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? Oh, no, I enlisted. I, I thought I. I went down right away, and uh, they interviewed me. And uh, let's see. Oh, I remember I had to take a lot of tests because I wanted to become an aviation cadet. And they gave me a lot of tests. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when did you enlist? April, I was sworn in on April 4th, 42. Okay. Um, why did you pick the Air Force? Because I wanted to fly. Mm -hmm. Had you ever flown? Never been in an airplane in my life, but I saw them up in the sky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Where did you go for your basic training? Well, uh, I originally was accepted, and I went to uh, Santa Ana, California, where I had ground school. I think it was ground school. Now, had you ever been away from home up, up until that point? No, except for children's camp. Mm -hmm. Did you get homesick or? No. D did you stay in contact with those at home oh, by yeah. letters? By letters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was your basic training like? Well, it was uh, uh, marching, uh, running, athletics, and school. Mm -hmm. That's right, basically. Mm -hmm. And from ground school, I, I might as well bring this subject in too. While I flew as a, what they call a 1034, do you know what a 1034 is? No. no. 1034 was, uh, was a navigator bombardier, double rated. I flew as a navigator bombardier, but when I first went in, I went into pilot school. I went to, uh, and, I, and I, after ground school for three months, I went to, I forget the name of the but I flew Stearman's. Mm -hmm. PT-17s? No, it wasn't a PC-17. Well, no, PT-17 Stearman. It was a Stearman. Right. Two, twin, two wing. Right. I flew Stearman's. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I graduated from uh, basic flight, went into secondary flight, and a week before graduation, I flunked out, I washed out. I don't recall why, but I think it had something to do with, uh, uh, on a forced landing, I didn't use good judgment. So they washed me out of flight school uh, as a pilot. And I, I had a lot of hours, I was very good at pilot school. I used to do, uh, you had to do a three-turn spin, I was able to do a five-turn spin. And I was able to do <coughs> snap rolls and slow rolls. But they washed me out anyway because I used very bad judgment on a, on a, uh, on a, <coughs> on a 
Fort Landing. Anyway, when I got before the court, because I had a very good ground school average, they said they didn't want to waste all that money, so they'd give me a chance instead of sending me as a private to the Air, air Corps, it was called then. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of going there, uh, because I had a good ground school, I had a chance to uh, go to a bombardier school or navigation school. And I asked them when my question was, how many weeks would I have to go to bombardier school? And how many? So bombardier school was 12 weeks, navigation school was 18 weeks. And I got my second, uh, second lieutenant commission, said I'll take the bombardier school because I want to get my commission right away. So I went to bombardier school. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in Deming, New Mexico. And in 12 weeks, I graduated, got my commission, and I was a bombardier. Bombardier wings, you know, they had bombardiers mm -hmm. in those days. But because at that time, for some reason, they needed bombardier aerial instructors and a good record, and they were taking it from my graduating class, so I became a bombardier instructor. And I was a bombardier flying instructor for almost 12 months. I remember that a lot of my students went to the 7th Air Force in England, where a very high percentage of them were killed or shot mm -hmm. down. The mm -hmm. 7th Air Force was a very dangerous place because they were flying over Germany mm -hmm. and uh, the air was always full of flak. Mm -hmm. So I was there a little over a year, and uh, what happened was that. By that time, sometime around the field, what months it was, but uh, the air, the war in the Pacific was heating up. And so they wanted dual rated uh, uh, flyers for the Asian war. And so they, I, they put dual rated means had to be a navigator, but I wasn't a navigator. So when they came to Deming, New Mexico, they asked for volunteers to go to navigation school. Well, I didn't volunteer. Nobody volunteered. Mm -hmm. We heard, don't volunteer for anything. And so they put papers in a hat and I pulled my name out. So I was picked to go to navigation school, which was Ellington Field in Houston, Texas. And I went to navigation school as a student officer. And I graduated. And I became what they call a 1034. 1032 is a bombardier, 1034. The 1034 is now a bombardier navigator. And so I became a navigator. And from there, after some, some uh, basic training with uh, machine guns and other stuff, I was sent to go to the Pacific. And that's how I wound up coming to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you go off the, to the Pacific? I went to the Pacific, let's see, it was. Uh, 1990, 1994, that's right. 1944. 1944. Okay. I went to the Pacific in 44. Let me ask you something. Did you, did you have any training on the Norden bomb site? Well, yes, as a bombardier instructor. Okay. I was, I, this, is, this, is the, this is the young lady. Norden bomb site, I was a specialist on the Norden bomb site. Okay. I was teaching uh, Norden bomb site to all my my, my cadet students. Mm -hmm. uh, my first my first experience as an instructor there was I'd walk into the classroom as an officer and there'd be the cadets standing up there and uh, as soon as I walked in they all came to attention. I said, Eddie, sit down. And they all sat down and I would talk about the uh, you know, bomb site and, and the wind and this, that, the other thing. And that was a, that was an over a little over a year. And when after I became a navigator, uh, I then went I, from there. Uh, we we got to the Pacific, the uh, West Coast, and from there they gave me. I got a crew. Uh, they formed a crew of which I was I was a senior because uh, I became a first lieutenant. But I think a little after that, not before that. Uh, and so I had a crew of six, uh, there was a crew of six. There was a pilot, a co-pilot, bombardier navigator, that was myself, and there were three gunners, a tail gunner, a 
Gunners, a uh, uh, belly gunner, and a radio gunner. Now, what type of aircraft was that? B-25, if you only B-25. Okay. It's B-25. Now, how did you like the B-25? I thought it was the greatest airplane around. Why? Because it, it was easy to fly, it was so safe, nothing ever happened to it. It was a great, it was one of the great airplanes. Uh, I, I, I love flying it. Matter of fact, the, the pilot and co-pilot let me handle it a good deal on the way over, although mm -hmm. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a, a pilot at that mm -hmm. time. I'd already left pilot school. And uh, let's see. When we left California, well, with my crew, we went, the first stop was Honolulu. I spent uh, seven days in Honolulu. And from there, we had to get to the Pacific. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> it, I don't know if this is any importance, but it was only an accident that I'm here now. Because what happened was, when we left Honolulu, we had to go to way to the Pacific. And to do that, we had an island hop. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and these little islands were 2,000 miles out, little two by four island. You had to find the island. When you got to, there was one Christmas island, and then there was Canton Island. They were 2,000 miles apart, little dots in the ocean on the way to the Pacific. And what happened was, I got to Canton Island, and then we were on our way to Christmas. No, I got to Christmas Island, we were on our way to Canton Island. Uh, and I was navigating with my, my crew. I got a picture of my crew here, right here. And uh, on the way to Canton Island, what happened was the wind, we were up at 15,000 feet, and the wind changed. And I was going, I was estimating where, we, where the island was. And finally, at the ETA, we, we saw the, an island. And I said, my gosh, that's where we right on time. Well, it's buzzing. We went down to, to Buzz the Island. Turned out it wasn't the island. It was an uncharted island. And all that came out of it was goonie birds. Mm -hmm. hit, almost hit the airplane. And I said, this is not the island. Where the hell are we? Uh, and uh, we didn't know where we were. Because, oh, at that time, we used to have a radio compass. And the island would broadcast from the radio compass and give us a, a, a compass heading into mm -hmm. the island. But for some reason, the radio compass was not working at that island at that time. So I said, I don't know where we are, but we got to be near. I'm going to go up and do what they call a sunline landfall. You know what a landfall is? No. A landfall is you go up in the sky, you shoot the sun, and you get a, a, you get a, a line of longitude. And then you, as, as you're flying, you go a few hundred miles, you go one hour out, and you plot where you're going to be in an hour, and there's a, a, a longitude line which is through the the island. And when you get to that 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 theoretical line, you head yourself north so that you know you're going to be north of the island. You hit the sun line, landfall line, and then you go straight south on a theoretical line to the island. Well, I did a sun line landfall. We must have had about 30 minutes left of fuel, and uh, at that moment, just as soon as I started to head south, the radio transmission went on from the island. And they took, gave us a compass heading, which was close to where we were going. I might have seen the island or not, as the case may be, but we followed the compass heading and we got to Canton Island. Had I not gotten to Canton Island, I'd still be eating booner birds out of the Pacific. <laughs> but we got to Canton Island, and then from there, we flew all the way. We got to the Philippines, and from the Philippines, I got to Okinawa, where I flew most of my missions. What unit were you assigned to? I was in the uh, 405th Bomb Squadron, which is called the Green Dragon Bomb Squadron, and it was part of the 38th Bomb Group. The 405th Bomb Squadron of the 38th Bomb Group. We were stationed in, uh, in Okinawa. In the Yantan Airstrip, there was a, uh, the air, airstrip that was called the Yantan Airstrip. And I was based on the north. That's where, uh, the, I am a little the north of where we were. It was your Ernie Pyle, the, I don't know if you've heard of Ernie yes. Pyle. He was killed there. Uh -huh. But he was on that island when I was there. 
Um, what were your, how many missions did you fly? I don't remember how many, but there were quite a few. Uh, and they were all against, they were all on, against J Japan, mostly against uh, freighters, uh, destroyers, and uh, there were some land targets, but most of the targets that I flew on were uh, ocean-going targets. And uh, <coughs> if, if you want to give me, an, I give you an experience. The most exciting uh, uh, flight missions that I flew on. The most. If I flew two of these type missions. These were what we call, and I don't know if you ever heard of it. We were called skip bombing missions. Oh, yes. you heard of you skip bombing? Mm -hmm. What we do is we start at fifteen thousand feet fly all the way down to the, right down to the ocean, right practically on the ocean. But that's only if we saw the destroyer in front of us. We head, the plane, nose of the plane, would head straight for the hull of the ship. I mean, we were very close to the ship, maybe 100 yards away or so. We aim for the ship. And just before we were just maybe seconds away, we dropped we had two 500 pound bombs on the wings and we'd press a button, drop the bombs, and as soon as the bombs dropped down and hit the water, it would skip up into the hull of the ship. Mm -hmm. As soon as we dropped the bombs, we'd shondell away. Because if we didn't do that soon enough, the bombs would hit our tail and we'd be killed. Mm -hmm. But we, I know that one destroyer, I know we sunk. We mm -hmm. heard, and if we hit the hull of the ship, the whole ship blew up. And I know I sunk one destroyer. On another mission, we hit another destroyer, but I don't know what happened there. Mm -hmm. We hit the, the hull of the ship, but we got away and we never heard what happened to that destroyer. That was the, the most exciting mission I flew on. Skip bombing mission against Japanese destroyers. They were, they were firing flak at you, they were firing at you. No, they didn't fire at us because no? they couldn't come down soon enough. Oh, no. The flak, the flak, there was flak in the air when we went down. Mm -hmm. But by the time the flak got down to where we were, we were gone. Mm -hmm. So we, we were not, there we weren't subject to flak. Mm -hmm. But in many of the other missions, we were subject to a lot of flak. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first time you were uh, um, subjected to fire by the enemy? Do you? Uh, I guess that would have been your first I, mission or so. Yeah, the first mission. I don't remember. Okay. Were you ever attacked by uh, Japanese fighters? We, they were the Zeros. We were not directly attacked to by them. Mm -hmm. uh, although we were close to a matter of fact, we did fire at uh, Zeros, but they never came close enough to us. Mm -hmm. And I remember on, on Okinawa, they used to come over every night. And they would be caught in a crossfire of, uh, of, 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 of beams, and we'd see them and fire on them, and then they would leave. Mm -hmm. That was the zeros that were, I think we called them zeros. Mm -hmm. Was your plane ever hit? Uh, on one mission, they hit the tail, of, uh, the tail of the ship, but we hobbled on back. We, 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 didn't, we didn't get hit badly, just the tail got somewhat damaged, but it was not bad enough and we were able to hobble back. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll give you another crazy incident. On one mission, we when we got to the initial point to get to the target, just as we were approaching it, one it was a, we, three planes. One plane suddenly developed engine trouble. And our squadron leader called my plane and said, turn around, go on back and t follow this plane back and let us know if, if, if he has to ditch where he's going to be so we can rescue him. So we turned back and the plane turned back with us while it was smoking. And part of, about an hour back, suddenly that plane that we were, we were tailing blew up and went into the ocean. And so we flew down, circled over the plane, but then, and we didn't see any, any survivors in the plane, and the plane sunk all the way down 
was gone. There was nothing there. And so I radioed the, the uh, I had a radio operator radio the, the, uh, the location of the plane. And we got back to, the, uh, to uh, Okinawa. And the reason I mention that is because after the war, about uh, four months after I was at home, I got a very sad letter from a woman who said, "My, I understand that you were following my son's plane. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that my son is still alive? And I had to write a letter saying, there's no chance, don't look forward, your son had to be gone because we saw the plane go down and the plane disappeared. There were no survivors. That was the same letter. I remember that particular mm -hmm. incident. Now, did you fly the same plane on every mission? No, we had different planes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. had different planes. And, and uh, at time period, they were different crews also. I didn't have my same. As a matter of fact, the co pilot of my original crew, Danny Frisbee, uh, he was on Okinawa, but he was with a different, he got right into the 38th Bomb Group and he didn't fly with us. But Danny Frisbee is the only one of my war experience that I now still see once a year we have dinner. He's out in Long Island, New York. Hmm. Danny Frisbee. I see he and his wife. Now, did you ever get the name of a plane at all? or? Yes. Uh, and I got, we would call the Flying Dragons. And as a matter of fact, I'll give you this. I mean, a large copy, but you, that's, I want to make small. This is the Flying Dragon. And this is my crew. Yeah, I'm sure. is in there. You'll see me in there. I don't know if you can make enough me. light to get this. Yeah, I got it. That's the Flying Dragon. Now, who did the artwork on it? What? The artwork. Uh, some yeah. of the crowd personnel did. Okay. Okay. All of our planes, by the way, that wasn't the only plane that had that. All of the planes in our squadron. And we were targeted by, there was a, on radio we used to hear Tokyo Rose. Ever hear Tokyo Rose? Mm -hmm. Tokyo Rose used to, to uh, bombard us with all sorts of things. As a matter of fact, we, somebody took a picture that took one of the planes that they shot down they captured the crew, they cut off their heads and they put them on the plane uh, wing and sent us pictures. We got pictures of them. Mm -hmm. I don't have the pictures. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to me. Now this is you and your crew. Yeah, you'll see me in the middle there. Matter of fact, I believe... This is you here? That's myself, yes. Okay. I was the only one that was a commissioned officer. They were all, in those days they had warrant officers. Do you know what a warrant officer was? Yes. Yep. Which one is he? The second. Okay. The pilot. Bill Strauch and his co-pilot Danny Frisbee were warrant officers. Okay. I was a first lieutenant. Now we can keep these? Oh yeah. Okay, okay. thank yeah. you very much. As a matter of fact, I have the, the original... It was a oh, basic I'd love to see that. I, I know, I, I, we don't have the jacket, Harry. We don't have the jacket? No, I don't know. Here is the, the plane, the, my original photograph of my crew. I'm going to make four by sixes of these, so if you want more copies Oh, okay, thank you. I can't, I wanted to keep those. Yes. I want to make four by six. Oh, That's okay. where I made those yeah. copies from this. There's a nice head on view of them. jacket then too. Oh yeah. I had a jacket which had it. It said 5th Air Force on it and then it had uh, the, the uh, an emblem on it. Mm -hmm. And that was about it. I, I don't have to take it. Oh you didn't have any, there wasn't any painting on it or? No, no. Oh okay. And I, I still have my uniform. We had a, uh, what do they call it? Blue ribbon. Uh, I had about three or four area ribbons because we were in Philippines and then Okinawa, and uh, I flew my missions from there. It was uh, 
that was that was the extent of my uh, now on all my missions I didn't have any especially exciting missions other than uh, hitting freighters that were loaded with supplies uh, and uh, we hit one land target or two land targets I don't remember too well I don't, you know it's 64 mm -hmm. years ago I, don't, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't remember too well but uh, I remember on the way to Japan there were islands on the way and we would pass over these islands and, and get on to the, the, where we would see the battleships or uh, destroyers. Destroyers were mostly, the, the, we, that, was, that was mostly our mission, were, were destroyers. Mm -hmm. And we, I know I sunk one and we know, I know we hit the other one. We may have sunk two destroyers altogether. Mm -hmm. which I felt was quite an accomplishment considering that um, we're only five people in that destroyer mm -hmm. and a lot of people mm -hmm. and it was a very multi-million dollar mm -hmm. uh, thing. Do you have any uh, stories that kind of stand out as, as being either amusing or inspirational to you? Or? Uh, not really. Um, I have to say this that I enjoyed, I kind of stupid, but I enjoyed uh, my entire time because I we were never hit, never hurt. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing I discovered many years later that I had uh, I was allergic to two things. I was allergic to morphine and I was allergic to Demerol, and I remember that. When we were flying missions, we had a, uh, a Red Cross kit, uh, and in it, in case any of us got hit, we were suffering and bleeding, we would get a shot of morphine. But I'm glad we never got hit, because the morphine would have thrown me into a, a real tizzy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know we never got, we never got, the uh, nobody in the plane ever got hit. And so I would say that my entire, that's why I was thinking first about coming to see you, because I didn't have any real, Exciting things. Well, I like, think the things you've talked about, the skip bombing against destroyers, and something. Well, that was, that was the most exciting thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. Were there any persons that served with you or you served with that stand out more than others? Well, my, my co pilot, Danny Frisbee, he, matter of fact, before he became a co pilot on my B 25, he was a P 51 pilot. As a matter of fact, he tells me he still has annual meetings with his squadron when he was a P-51 pilot. Mm -hmm. His name is Danny, Daniel Frisbee, F-R-I-S-B-I-E. As a matter of fact, that's the Danny Frisbee right here. Mm -hmm. that's, you have that picture. Mm -hmm. That's Danny Frisbee. Mm -hmm. And that's, our plane is in the background there. And uh, I remember all the people there. I remember their names. Danny Frisbee, Bill Stroud, uh, Lenny Knazic, uh, Rocco Lascalzo. And, uh, and he found that here is a, if you want a picture of this, I can make it. Okay. That's my crew. Oh, that has the names on it. Yes. Yeah. Let me focus in on that, Mike. I'll make, I'll make four by fives of these and I'll send you a couple of cards of each. Okay. Yeah. Well, those are nice photographs. Yeah. In, I can tell you, in, in later life, uh, Bill Strauch, who was the first pilot, became a firefighter and he retired way out on Long Island. Danny Frisbee became uh, a professor at Long Island, at the Stony Brook University. Uh, Rocco Lascalzo, I don't know what happened with him. And Atlantic Kanazic went to California. And I don't remember. He, 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 this fellow was the, uh, his parents owned a, a uh, 
at a local grocery store in uh, Rochester, New York, and he went back then. That's all I remember about that. Mm -hmm. I remember I was only, uh, when I flew those missions, I was only, let's see, I got in, I was about, uh, well, I got out when I was 20, I got out in, in, I was in for just about four years. I was in from April 4th, 42, to uh, May 1st, 46. And, uh, I, I can give you a, this is an amusing incident, and may be of no consequence, but I remember it. When I was on uh, Okinawa, we used to get packages from home with food in it. Mm -hmm. Take months to get there. So I once, I was in my tent with my people in my group, and I got a package from home from my mother. And in it was, uh, a salami and a can of tuna fish. So I said, I'm not going to open the can of tuna fish. Yeah, put, it, put the tuna fish in my bag. And I said, I looked at the salami and said, I don't like salami. And while I was holding it, the salami disappeared. And in two minutes, it was gone. It was all eaten. And the, the reason I mention this is because when the war ended, I was discharged at Fort Dix. And I finally got home, my parents were living in Brooklyn on Montgomery Street. But when I finally took the train and got home, they weren't there, they were in Florida. And when I sat down at the, in the, in the home, it was a private two-family home, I was very hungry. And I wanted to eat something, and then I remembered in my can was a can of tuna fish. And I, believe it or not, it was still in there, I opened it up, and I ate the tuna fish. That tuna fish was which went from Okinawa back to Brooklyn. <laughs> that was my can of tuna fish. Uh, let's see, what is it? Anything else? Well, you spent seven years in the Air National Guard afterwards. Well, yeah, I was in the Air National Guard. I, mean, I went into business, you know, my own business, and became an entrepreneur, sort of an entrepreneur. Uh, and I used to fly monthly with the Air National Guard. But my business got very busy, and I just didn't have the time, so I resigned my commission. And uh, I found out that uh, my National Guard unit, about eight months later, went to Korea. Oh, but I, I was out of it. I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been in business if I'd gone to Korea. Now, how long were you in the Guard, right? From 46 Only about, to... Uh, no, I, originally I was in the Air Force Reserve. Mm -hmm. From the Air Force Reserve, we went into the Air National Guard. I was there until about... Uh, From Floyd Bennett Airfield in Brooklyn. Yeah, Floyd Bennett Airfield. I think it's still there. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Matter of fact, when I was flying with the Air Force Reserve, I wanted my wife to get, I put her in a pair of pants and my jacket. And I said, come on, we'll get in, I'll get you in the plane here. We'll but they saw she was a woman. If they said nothing to her, they wouldn't let her on. So you married right at, at the end of the war? Uh, I married in 48, two years after. So you left the guard about 1949 or something? About 1948, 49. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, the, the CEO of the International Guard was something in Colonel Laurel. I don't know. I think it's L A U R O. Did you ever see any USO shows while you were overseas? Oh yeah. By the way, on the way over, mm -hmm. we saw one movie on every island we went to. It was a, fa a very famous movie, and on all the bathroom doors, you know what it said. You know what it said? No. Every single one of them on every island, Kilroy was here. <laughs> <laughs> you ever hear the term? Yes. Kilroy? Yeah. I saw it was written in, in hand painted. Kilroy was here. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's something. The stupid things you remember. Now, when you uh, were discharged and we heard, well, before that, I well, yeah, ask. Let me, let me okay, sure. This. After the war, the the last mission was a, a day or two before Hiroshima had happened, but the war wasn't over. Mm -hmm. Two days later, 
we hit Nagasaki, and that's when the war ended. It was around, I think, September, I forget, it was, it, it was 1945. Mm -hmm. And then they sent uh, troops and planes up to Japan, and they wouldn't send our squadron in because we were just cruised, so they sent us down to the Dutch East Indies. And I spent about three months on the Dutch East Indies. And then we went back to Okinawa, and from there, they sent us up to Japan. And I was in Japan for about four months. And I remember my time in Japan was a very pleasant time. They were very friendly. Mm -hmm. I mean, a Japanese, uh, matter of fact, I even had a Japanese girlfriend. Uh, because when I got to Japan, I met a Japanese young man who was a reporter for one of the newspapers, and we became friendly, and he asked me to come to his home. And I went to his home, take our shoes off at the door, and we went inside, and uh, he introduced me to his sister. Tamiya Shina Harry was her name. So for a little while, she was my girl, just temporary girlfriend, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was about the science of it. And so I was in Japan for about no, what were your duties while you were in Japan? No duties at all. We just had to fly once a month and mm -hmm. keep our things going. We had no, no duties in Japan. Mm -hmm. and How then, did you find the Japanese people outside uh, of this family? I, well, I didn't get to know them, but they mm -hmm. were very friendly. Mm -hmm. Very friendly. And one of the things I noticed about Japan was that when you went from, had to go into town, everybody was wearing masks because there was all kinds of Whatever it, it is, breathe, it would kill you. So, wherever you got on a train, you had to wear a mask. And that was it. Uh, but, uh, I'm just trying to think of the thing to stop. Well, whatever it was, uh, I don't remember now. But uh, I took the train occasionally. And the Japanese, I don't understand, well, here we were. We, we, we dropped the atomic bombs on them. I think we're unbelievably friendly. Mm -hmm. I didn't meet any Japanese that were not friendly. Mm -hmm. Nobody tried to kill us or whatever. We just met them and I went to the, this one home and it was very nice. Then, uh, then it came time for us to come back home and they, had a, they started to add up all the points. Mm -hmm. They had so many missions, I've had this, so many points. So many months during the service, so many points. And I had a certain amount of points, and uh, I could have, I had my choice. I could come back by air, but I had to wait three months to get my reservation on the plane. Or I could go back by, by boat and go out right away. And I figured I'd, I'd want to leave right away. And so I got what they call it a liberty ship. And I can tell you one thing, here I am, a couple of thousand hours in the air, and I was doing great. I got in his liberty ship, but I was seasick the whole time. Mm -hmm. I used to throw up on a ship. You tell them how many days it took. <laughs> it, took 30, it took over 30 days to get back on, on mm -hmm. the liberty ship. I wound up in, the, in Seattle, and they greeted us, state dinner, and then I got the train back to, uh, to uh, Fort Dix. I was discharged from Fort Dix. Do you remember where you were when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Yes. Uh, where was I? I heard about it. Uh, what year was he? Uh, well, it's 45. It must have been while you were in Oklahoma. Around April, he yeah, died. Yeah, I, I heard something about it. I was just wondering if he yeah, had a Yeah, because I remember he had polio. Mm -hmm. He had polio. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing about it on the air, mm -hmm. uh, on the radio. What was your reaction when you heard about the atomic bombs? Uh, Oh, when I heard the atomic bombs, I said, we're going to be, the war's going to be over. Mm -hmm. The war is definitely going to be over. At the first Hiroshima, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people killed, and the war wasn't over. Mm -hmm. I think that was Truman was our president yes. at that time. And he was the one that decided we'll send the second one over, which was Nagasaki. And when that hit, the Japanese decided, the reason, the reason Truman said, we don't want to, lose 50,000 American troops by trying to invade Japan, we got the bomb, we'll drop it. And he dropped that second bomb, and that within one day the war was over, they surrendered. Mm -hmm. I think Hirohito was the... Uh, yes.
Um, when you left the service, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Yes. For one of the first thing, I was broke when I got out. So you must have used a 5220 club. 20 club. I used to go down, sign something, and give me a twenty dollar bill. And uh, uh, then after the fifty-two twenty club, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't have any experience in business. I had no business experience, and no. Uh, I didn't have a college degree, a partial college, but I didn't have a college degree. And I was married. My wife was earning money. She was on the, she was giving piano lessons and uh, Department of Welfare. She was uh, worked for the Department of Welfare. So she earned money and I was at home. What the hell am I going to do? I got to earn a living, but I wasn't doing anything. So I used to sit home and paint, or do oil paintings. I painted my portrait, I painted a lot of stuff, uh, and uh, I, I, I'll tell you this, I don't know if there's any consequence, but something accidentally happened. I visited a, a friend of mine that was in the Air Force, he was in business. He was in the handbag business, and he was making handbags with a substance called Bakelite. Have you ever heard of it? Bakelite. And he showed me some of the handbags. He says, the business is good, but he says, I got one serious problem. I said, what's your problem? He says, this goddamn stuff. I make a handbag, but it sticks to glass. It sticks to itself. And it kills a lot of my time. And he gives me a piece of black material and a piece of white material. And I take the material home. And I did the thought occurred to me. I cut some letters out of the black material. And I put it on the white material, and I put cut some letters out of the white material, and it made a sign. I said, hey, these are interchangeable signs. So I invented the interchangeable sign. I bought plastic from various people, and I learned how to, to die cutting it. I designed letters, and I would make lead, I would I die cut letters buy background pieces, red and blue background mm -hmm. plastic, which stuck to windows. And I die cut the letters and put them in a little box. And so I went out and I sold what we called interchange box, a box full of letters and backgrounds, store to store. And I remember my wife was at the Department of Welfare and I, uh, I, I, I went out one day with about 12 boxes. I called my wife up at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, I sold all 12. I sold all 12 of them. Boy, this is great. Went, you went to New Jersey. I went to New Jersey. I didn't want anybody to see what I was doing. Uh -huh. I didn't want anybody to copy me. I sold all 12. And I had to come back and my wife and I would put more letters together, put in the box. Uh, and uh, uh, I rented a little place in the back of a store to, to assemble the stuff because by this time we were making a lot of kids. And what happened was, this is the craziest thing in the world. I'm sitting at a desk in my, in this little, back of the little junky little store where I was renting. And I was, where I was shipping all the sign kits out, making some money. And two guys walk into the store and come up to my desk. And I'll never forget the verbal abuse I got. These two guys, they were both kind of gangsters, numbers collectors. And a big guy comes up to me, points his finger at me. Here I am, I'm running a little business here. He says, you the guys that make that shit that sticks on the window? I said, well, I make the interchangeable side kids. And he says to me, he and his friend, Irving Collins was his name. I can sell that shit. I said, fine, I'll give you a sample. But I ain't going to do it on my buck. I'm going to do it on your buck. So I gave him a $100 advance, and he left the place with my samples. And by gosh, that time, every day, I got seven or eight orders in from him. And that started it. He went all over. He wouldn't come back to New York because the chances were after him. And what happened was that people all over the country started to see these, and a lot of, but within 
by 1952, 53, had about 200 salesmen, store-to-store salespeople. And that was the start of my business. Mm. That's something. Yeah. That's how I. That's how I got into business. And then from there, I went into. I, I did other things. I, uh, as a matter of fact, the second thing was also an accident. Uh, I had rented a place on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, where we had. I had this little factory, and uh, I had a cousin who was a lawyer who had a lot of uh, uh, connections with architects. And he said, why don't you put your own building up? He, he, he got, got, had to go from Long Island to the building. <coughs> put your own. I said, why not? I put it. He said, well, I'll give you the name of a good architect. He gave me the name of an architect. He became a very nice guy. He was a very award-winning architect. He designed the building for me, and I found a piece of land on Long Island, Garden City Park, and I hired a couple of contractors, and they built this building for me, 14,000 foot building. But I, as they built the building, I went around with them, looked at all the plans. So I had this building. And that's why I then relocated my factory to this building. But by then, I knew how to build a building because I already had all the plans. So then I, I, went, I built some industrial building. That was my second, uh, mm -hmm. my second thing. And uh, I had a third thing, that, uh, another accident at the <coughs> crossroads of life. Uh, I like to play tennis, and uh, I, the only place we could play indoor in the wintertime, there was a little indoor tennis building in, uh, in, in Lake Success. In Great Lake. In Great Lake. A little, a little indoor tennis building where you had to pay money to, to play indoor tennis. They rented by the hour or two hours mm -hmm. during the wintertime. So I did that. and. Uh, uh, but we, they only had hours like 8 in the morning, that was terrible. So finally I, they were going to put up a second court, and I found out they were going to put up a second court, because I got a hold of the guy that owned it, and said, I actually ain't going to put up a second court. Yeah, we, we didn't start to build it, we were building it. He said, well, I want a Saturday morning. He says, we're already booked out. I said, we didn't build it up. He said, but everybody wants it, we, we don't have any space. I said, the hell with that, I had to build it, I'll build my own damn court. And that's what happened. I built a couple of indoor tennis buildings on Long Island and out in Queens. I got into the indoor tennis building. So I had industrial buildings and indoor tennis buildings. And that was how I got into that building. It was all an accident. Well, well that, I'm going to go back to your military yes, time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, after you left the service, did you uh, join any veterans organizations at no, all? No, I just was just in the. Uh, I just in the. Uh, and the National Guard and the, mm -hmm. I didn't join, join any organizations. Okay. Now you said you, you did keep in touch with your crew. Uh, no, the, the, the only one was Danny Danny, Danny. okay. Um, how do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Uh, well, it took up four and a half, five years of my most important years of when I was 20 to 25. Uh, and it changed my outlook on what I wanted to do. When I first got out in 1946, 47, I decided I, I have an older brother who was a battalion surgeon. He's five years older than I am. He's now he's 90. Uh, and I said, I think I want to become an MD. So I, I remember calling up Harvard, and I said, I'd like to go to medical school, but I don't have a complete college degree. They said, come on up here, take some tests, and we'll see whether what we can do for you. I remember going to Harvard. I saw an, an advisor. I took a lot of tests. And he said, we'll let you know. And I went back home and back to Brooklyn. And I got a telegram saying, you've been accepted, get up here, and we'll enroll you. You can spend two years getting an undergraduate degree, and then you'll go to medical school. And I said, gee, that's great. And I had this telegram. But before I went up there, I started to think. Here I am, 25, 26 years old. Yeah, I was 25, 26. I said, my gosh, two more years of undergraduate work, four years of medical, six, three years as a resident, 
I'll be, I'll be COD till I'm 40. I said, that's crazy, I can't do that. So no, I'll, I'll find a way to make some money. And that's how I got into business. I didn't go up there. And that was a crossroad. Uh, I didn't go to medical school. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for the interview. Yeah. I'm sorry I don't have more. No, that was a very good interview. Uh,